While Planeswalkers are certainly one of Magic's most iconic ideas, it's hard to say that their powers and abilities have been all that consistent throughout the years. The one detail that is always consistent is the fact that they are powerful mages who can travel between different planes of reality through the Aether space known as the Blind Eternities, thanks to a power called a Spark. Beyond this, there have been both retcons and in-universe changes to how Planeswalkers work at various points throughout the game's lore. In fact, the nature of what a Planeswalker can do has been a through line in Magic's story since its earliest days, and has even played a key factor in some of the most recent story beats in Magic the Gathering. This video will not cover all the story beats in great detail, but instead aims to track the development of Planeswalkers in the lore and how major story events have forever changed what it means to be a Planeswalker. Even in the earliest days of Magic's lore, the exact power sets of Planeswalkers were ambiguous. These beings were first conceived as a lore-friendly explanation for games of Magic, with two Planeswalkers casting spells and summoning creatures from different planes of reality in a direct battle. Early Magic lore went on to establish the first in-universe Planeswalker, like Jared Carthalion, in the earliest explanations and definitions for the concepts such as the Spark. In the Arena novel, it was established that a Planeswalker Spark was something born from collecting immense levels of mana. This idea would be abandoned as Planeswalkers were more fleshed out, leading to our current understanding of the nature of a Spark. Contrary to the original Arena interpretation, a Spark is something inherent to an individual that cannot be created artificially or even passed down genetically. Planeswalkers first ignite their Spark in moments of intensity, most often coming in the form of near-death experiences. In instances where someone directly tried to ignite a spark, the methods by doing so usually involved deathly trauma, such as Gaia Drone Dehada consuming Darkon's soul to ignite a spark. From there, a planeswalker's latent ability unlocks and they instinctively planeswalk to a new plane and gain all the abilities that come with being a planeswalker. While not confirmed in canon, some of the out-of-date internal documents once described a spark as something of a birthmark on the soul that is imbued with aether. They can appear in any sapient species in the multiverse, so long as that species was not artificially created. By default, the spark is intangible, and inherently a part of the planeswalker's soul. Beyond access to traveling to other planes via the blind eternities, the spark gives planeswalkers access to mana from multiple planes, as opposed to just the one they're currently on. This is generally how planeswalkers have functioned for years now. However, this was not always the extent of the power granted to those with the spark. From the beginning of time until the most recent 60 or so years of magic story, planeswalkers were vastly more powerful beings. They were functionally immortal and nigh unkillable by anything other than a fellow planeswalker. Beyond this, they were also unfathomably powerful mages with the ability to create entire planes of reality on their own. These original planeswalkers could not only travel to other planes themselves, but were also able to bring others alongside them. Planeswalkers were essentially gods with the power to create and change worlds almost entirely at their own whim. Of these godlike old planeswalkers, perhaps none are more important to explain the impact and power of planeswalkers like Urza. There are enough major events and plot lines caused by or involving Urza to make several videos in their own right. He's such an important character that the Dominaria's calendar system is the Argivian Reckoning, which marks year 0 AR as the year Urza was born. To make a long story short, Urza was a human artificer born at Dominaria who came into bitter conflict with his brother, Mishra. This war waged for years and led to the devastation of the plane's peoples and the natural resources. The war drove both sides to find further means of strength, leading to Mishra eventually being overtaken by the Phyrexians and his ambition. Phyrexians were a group of bioengineered beings made via completing living beings and converting them into Phyrexians. In an effort to end the war and stave off the tide of Phyrexian influence on the plane, Urza made things even worse for pretty much everybody by detonating Urza's Silex. This modified ancient weapon caused a massive explosion that sent the entire plane into cataclysm. Dominaria entered an ice age that lasted for over 2,000 years, until another planeswalker named Freylize dispelled it for him with the World Song. The blast also destabilized the plane itself, locking it off from various visitors from other planes, and eventually leading to time rips open on the planet as the fabric of Dominaria's reality slowly tore itself apart hundreds of years after the blast. Urza, for his part, was vaporized by the explosion, but this ignited his planeswalker spark and essentially revived him as a god. Urza killed his brother, countless innocents, and set Dominar on a path of turmoil and destruction that would last for thousands of years. In return, he didn't really face any repercussions beyond his own personal guilt, and gained godly powers in the process. While Urza would eventually return to try and clean up his mess on Dominaria, he only really cared about getting his revenge on the Phyrexians. 
and eventually he would get that revenge at the cost of countless lives including his own. This however did a little for Dominara's overall structure and stability, as Urza simply did not seem to notice or care about the instability of the plane that he had caused. While detonating the Silex was the moment that gave Urza his godlike abilities, it is also the moment that would eventually lead to those same powers granted to all planeswalkers eventually going away. This is because, while the actual detonation mainly impacted life on Dominaria, the attempts at fixing Dominaria would have long spread implications for the entire multiverse. While Urza himself does leave the story at this point, he does provide one of the earliest examples in lore of a planeswalker donating their spark to someone else. In this case, he imbued Karn's silver golem with the spark upon his death and staving off the Phyrexian invasion. Karn, for his part, would leave Dominaria and use his newfound Planeswalker's abilities to create the Plane of Argentum, leaving Dominaria and the Crisis on it behind. It would instead be Urza's former student, Teferi Akosa of Zalfir, who would attempt to finally close the time rifts of Dominaria. Given that he was a Planeswalker that initially fled Dominaria alongside his friend Jahori of the Gitu during the Phyrex invasion of Dominaria, and spent hundreds of years in hiding before returning to their respective home regions of Dominaria, Zalfir, and Shiv, it was then that Teferi realized the full scope of his former teacher's impact on the plane, learning that Dominaria was nearly devoid of mana, and that many of the remaining mages on the plane had restored to temporal manipulation in an attempt to abuse the rifts instead of being harmed by them. This only further destabilized the plane as the fabric of reality was pulled apart, not just by the rifts, but also by forces actively manipulating them. Unwilling to see his home destroyed, Teferi formed a group in an attempt to close the time rifts that had opened up over each major region of Dominaria. The act of closing a time rift was no easy task, even for a time mage such as Teferi. Even just closing one rift cost Teferi his planeswalker spark, rendering him mortal once more. A bleat still ageless thanks to his master of temporal magic. Other planeswalkers, such as the aforementioned Freilies, would sacrifice their lives entirely to assist in closing the rifts, though with Freilies dying to sealing the rift over Keld, and another powerful planeswalker named Lord Wingrace sacrificed himself for his home of Urborg. The soul of Wingrace still watches over Urborg to this day. Eventually, each rift one by one was closed, with another planeswalker offering up their spark, if not their life outright, to heal the plane. This all came to head with Jessica, thrice reborn, closing the final rift that had been opened over Ortaria. Jessica is another character whose personal story could warrant its own video. Yet for our purposes here, what's important is that she was a powerful barbarian planeswalker who had a history of being corrupted by others. While she did truly have noble intentions in sealing all the rifts, manipulation from others caused her to be cruel and careless in some of her sealings. She used another planeswalker spark instead of her own for one rift, and when she sealed the rift over to Fairy's home, Zalfir, her sloppy method caused the entire region of Zalfir to be phased out of reality. This left Teferi, who was no longer a planeswalker, unable to restore his home or even seek it out. She would eventually overcome this influence and use her immense strength to finally close the largest rift in Dominaria. Almost instantly, mana would begin to properly flow through the land, and the time-displaced beings were all sent back to their proper times. While the closing of the rifts had been intended to heal the damage caused specifically to Dominaria, the sheer level of damage done to reality by rifts extended far past Dominaria. Thus, as the last rift was closed and Jessica died in the process, the Great Mending of 4500 AR began. The Great Mending fundamentally changed the balance and makeup of the multiverse. Civilizations such as the Thran had created and mastered the necessary technology to travel across the multiverse without a spark. All of these planar portals ceased to work after the Mending, as well as any interplanar vessels such as the Skyship or Weatherlight. Planeswalkers themselves were also unable to bring others alongside them, meaning characters like Jihora, who once traveled alongside planeswalkers, were now stranded on the plane they currently inhabited. Even more notable than this loss of interplanet travel for non-planeswalkers was the impact the Mending had on planeswalkers themselves. The once godlike planeswalkers were now all remarkably mortal. While they still possessed great magical ability, it was a mere fraction of what a fully actualized pre-Mending planeswalker was capable of. Even planeswalkers with naturally long lives, such as the dragon Nico Bolas, now had to grapple with the limits of their power. The dragon god in particular chafed against the idea of this newfound weakness and instantly set plans into motion in order to restore his fraying omnipotence. One of his earliest strategies was forming a loose collection of allied planeswalkers whom he could recruit into his machinations. The recruitment of powerful allies led him to find Lillian Vess, a planeswalker who was a master of necromancy, yet now unwilling to face the mortality that came with her old age now the Mending had taken away her eternal youth. Nico Bolas brokered a deal with the desperate Lillian and four powerful demon lords on four different planes to give Lillian her youth back. 
Nico Bolas asked for nothing immediately, but would opt instead to call upon his debt when most beneficial to him. Lillian herself had been so desperate to reclaim even a fraction of her premending power, she made deals that would complicate her life and magic story for years to come. Most planeswalkers did settle into some form of acceptance over the bending's effects on their powers. Yet Nico Bolas would attempt multiple schemes throughout the following years in an attempt to become all-powerful once more. This would kickstart what is known as the Bolas arc in Magic Story, which branched multiple sets in years. While the broad strokes of the story are unimportant for our current topic, given that his primary goal was to regain his pre-mending powers, his schemes sometimes offered more insight in the nature of the post-mending multiverse, and specifically how related to Planeswalkers. His schemes saw him interfere indirectly with the plane of Kaladesh, a plane that is abundant with Aether to a point of being almost entirely centered on its cultivation. This is partly thanks to the Great Aether Boom of Kaladesh, which just so happened to occur this same year as the Great Mending. This Aether Boom led to vast leaps in technology in all fields. But given Aether's inherent link to the Blind Eternities, this boom period saw with it the first working interplanar travel tech, thanks to the exploits of the inventor Rashmi. She created the first working planar portal since the Mending, and the first one of its kind on Kaladesh at all. However, this invention was quickly stolen by Tezzeret, and given to Nico Bolas for his plans. The portal was imperfect as it could not transport living matter, but this proved inconsequential for Bolas who aimed to use it to deploy his undead army. The Bolas arc would also see the return of Teferi as a major character, as the story saw characters converge on Dominara to seek allies and tools to fight against Bolas. Teferi for his part had settled down and started a family with Subiria. He never abandoned his goals of one day restoring Zalfir from its displacement in time. This led to him assisting in seeking artifacts to use against Bolas, hoping one might provide a way for him to restore his home. While he did not find anything directly on this front, he was able to restore his spark with the help of his old friend, Jihoria, and thus was able to pursue his goals of righting the biggest wrong of the Mending on a wider scale. But the multiverse had other plans in the meanwhile for Bolas' scheming for omnipotence never ended. And while many of his plans were interesting and could perhaps further inform the nature of Spark, none are better examples of this than his most effective and final attempt, the War of the Spark. This event took place in the plain of Ravnica in the year 4560 AR, which Nicol Bolas aimed to harvest the spark of every other planeswalker to bolster his power. Spark harvesting was done via the Elder Spell, a spell capable of killing a planeswalker after mere moments of contact via severing the spark from their soul. Using his army of eternal soldiers, Nico Bolas killed off hundreds of planeswalkers to fuel his own power, although very few of which were actually named characters in the game or story. Bolas would prove unsuccessful in the end due to the sacrifice of Gideon Jura, but provided further destabilization to both the planeswalkers' population and the multiverse as a whole. The Bolas arc also established with it the groundworks for the next storyline, which unfolded over the next two years of lore and universe. Tezzeret had been working alongside New Phyrexia, an offshoot of the original Phyrexia that eventually took over Karn's plane of Argentum. This partnership between Phyrexia and Tezzeret lasted for years, and had given them access to the same planar bridge technology they had stolen from Bolas. Phyrexia first used to send Vorin collects to the plane of Kaldenheim. Notably, Phyrexians are half machines, half organic, meaning that while Vorin collects suffered heavy damage and needed time to rebuild and recover, he was able to survive being transported across planes via the upgraded and adapted planar tech. This was the true beginning of the Phyrexian arc, which at the time of recording is the most recent arc of Magic the Gathering, which had nearly as big of an impact on the nature of planeswalkers in the multiverse that the Great Mending did. Vorinclex stole the sap of the World Tree and returned to the new Phyrexia. Phyrexia was planning a mass invasion of the entire multiverse to spread their ideology as far as possible. Given that Kalenheim's World Tree served as a connector for the Ten Realms that make up its plane, Phyrexia theorized this sort of world-connecting tree could be cultivated on a multiversal scale, with branches and vines spreading through planar portals and out in every other plane. While gathering this sap was the first step in cultivating Wellbreaker the invasion tree, Phyrexia's plan took a more direct route when another Phyrexian predator traveled to another plane. This time, Jingitaxia snuck into Kamigawa to study their native Kami. While there, he perfected the method of completing planeswalkers. Up until now, this had been impossible with even post-mending planeswalkers being immune to Phyrexius. With even planeswalkers now actively serving Phyrexia, the threat of the imminent invasion grew even greater. The heroes scrambled for a means to stave off the new Phyrexia, even going so far as to seek out and rebuild the weapon that caused the time rifts in the first place with the newly built Karn Silex. Teferi sent his spirit back in time to when Urza detonated the Silex initially to learn how to activate the device. However, Teferi was unable to return to his proper time as he got essentially tangled with the time itself alongside his home of Zalfir. The other heroes presumed Teferi died and did their best to fight off the Phyrexia, 
only for Karn Silex to be destroyed and Karn himself dismantled by Phyrexia. While the Artificer Sahili Rai was able to create a new Silex they were able to detonate, the attempt to detonate it on Phyrexia only led to even more Planeswalkers getting completed in the process. Jace fought off his completion for as long as he could, opting to finally detonate the Silex on the Realm Breaker in a final attempt to stop Phyrexia before it consumed him. He was stopped by Elspeth Tyrrell, a fellow Planeswalker who did not want to risk detonate the Silex so close to a tree that was connected to several other planes already, and risk harming them. Instead, she planeswalked directly into the Blind Eternities and detonated the Silex there. From there, the Phyrexian invasion of 4562 AR was staved off in part thanks to the efforts of a planeswalker named Ren, who could commune with trees. She connected with the Realmbreaker and was able to find Zalfir, and by extension, Teferi. Not only did this free the once displaced region, it forced New Phyrexia out of reality in its stead. This created Zelfir as a standalone plane independent of Dominaria and removed New Phyrexia entirely from the wider multiverse. In the aftermath of the conflict, it was found that through the sacrifice of Karn's spark and the life of someone immune to Phyrexius, they were able to uncomplete a small number of planeswalkers. These were not the only sparks lost, however, as in the days following the invasion came the Great Desparking. Between Elspeth Silex Blast and the various holes in reality torn by Realmbreaker, it's hard to say for certain what caused the Great Desparking. But for one reason or another, a large number of Planeswalkers suddenly lost their sparks, and found themselves stuck whatever plane they were on at the time. Considering many Planeswalkers opted to defend their home planes in the Phyrexian invasion, many are now simply stuck at home. But others have found themselves in more precarious spots thanks to the sudden loss of ability. Even Teferi would lose a spark, finally retiring to his home of Zalfir after 60 years of searching for it. While some planeswalkers, such as Chandra and Alar, retained their sparks and made it through the invasion relatively unchanged, it's uncertain just how many planeswalkers remain. Despite this, travel between planes has arguably never been easier. Another repercussion of the invasion was the creation of the Omen Paths, passageways between one plane and another. The invasion linked planes together in a way that really has not been seen before. This connection was so intense that during the invasion, an artifact on Ravnica was able to provide power to its ancestral owners on the plane of Chandelar. And now, planes are able to intermingle in far more active ways, with direct entry points already allowing for Magic's iconic creature types to wind up in situations they never would have before. So even those who have now lost their spark are still able to travel to some planes. Oblique, they lack the freedom and control that the planeswalkers have. These story developments are fairly recent at the time of recording, and as such, it's hard to say for sure where Magic's story will progress from here. Planeswalkers were once mythical beings so powerful they could not be depicted properly in cards. Then, after the mending, planeswalkers were finally at a power level reasonable enough to be printed on cards. Yet, the game progressed to a point where eventually, even these powerful pre-mending planeswalkers were depicted on cards, despite them once being seen as an impossibility. In some ways, the Great Disparking can be seen as an attempt to return to the idea of planeswalkers being a more powerful and exclusive thing to be. And with the Omen Paths now allowing for non-planeswalker characters to be involved in storylines that don't take place on their home plane, perhaps this could even signal a shift towards a more pre-mending approach to Magic's character focus. Planeswalkers do not seem to have gotten any more powerful after the Great Desparking, so this can be seen as less undoing the Great Mending, and more so the next stage in development in the fabric of the multiverse. Planeswalkers are rarer than ever, and arguably weaker than ever as well, yet they will forever remain an integral part of the lore and the multiverse. Despite this, the exact nature of the spark still remains mostly a mystery. While it can be used to heal a soul or seal a rift, there does not seem to be a set rule for just exactly how or why. While generally intangible, the Great Disparking has shown characters like Nahiru actively contain their spark, only to lose it after the container was destroyed and thus become truly sparkless. It's unlikely we'll ever get a true explanation of the full nature of the spark, seeing as how it's a concept that has existed for as long as there have been planeswalkers, and yet each new detail we learn only further muddles its full definition. Regardless of where the great disparking leads to the story of magic, it's safe to say this is nothing the storyline hasn't done before. For as long as there have been planeswalkers, the lore has been changing and shifting as to just what that means and what comes with it. While sometimes these tweaks have come from minor retcons or explanations, other times these reworks come in overt, massive story moments that serve as hallmark moments for the multiverse's history. Almost every modern Magic the Gathering storyline can trace its roots to something that occurred either because of the mending of Dominaria, or because of the person who caused Dominaria to need a mending in the first place. Some details and characters had to be glossed over, such as Jaya Ballard, the pre-mending planeswalker who simply just let herself age after losing her eternal youth, and ended her time in the story as a wizened yet still sharp old woman. 
But if we went into detail on every little thing in this video, it would have been far too long. Instead, the hope was to offer an overview of the ever-changing nature of being a planeswalker, and some of the major story beats that come alongside it. Alright, and that's the video. Was there a topic bench in the video you'd like to see expanded on its own video? Or do you have an unrelated idea you'd feel would be a good fit for the unknown side of series? Feel free to comment them down below.